beautiful. Oh, okay. Okay. So I want you to open your books to chapter one, page seven. Okay, so the site that we're at, you see the aerial photograph there on page six, and it's, it's taken from a vantage point of looking towards the site of Hebron that we're gonna go to next, Tel Hebron, which is uh, in the distance there, um, over a mile away. You can see the excavation picture that next to there from, uh, from the 1920s, when a guy named Mater, a German archeologist, came and excavated here. <coughs> Okay, now what I wanna do is I wanna just play a game, so don't cheat. And I know you know this is a biblical site, but let's look at nine, number nine. And I just wanna look around and let's pretend that the Bible, we don't have the Bible. That this isn't a biblical site, okay? That we don't have the Bible to tell us what this site is. And just think of it purely from an archeological standpoint and if you look at this uh, aerial photograph, we shot straight down on the site, my son and I, on uh, page nine. And, uh, and I just want to go through some of these structures. The first one, I just want to walk over and show you where it is, though you can't see it, but I found that you don't retain things if you don't go look for them. Even if you can't see them, to stand where that place is helps you retain things. So, so come with me. And we're just going to walk back here. And in fact, Modder found some structures back here. And when they were working to fix this place up, oh, it was a couple years ago now, I guess, they exposed some of the large stones from the structure that Modder found here. Okay, so it's right here where he found them. And, uh, and look at the drawing. I put the drawing down at the bottom of the page there and we're gonna, we're gonna be seeing these later. But there are two basic square stone structures with big stones. They exposed some of those stones when they were making this path that we're walking on two years ago. Okay, now you can look at the picture and see what's here today where these stone structures are. All this stuff is over the top of it. Okay. And I know you're thinking, okay, whatever. This, these stone structures are totally different than this wall that you see here. This wall is much later. These stone structures are much earlier. Okay, so take a look at this corner. We'll do a snake and around. I just want to show you because I'm going to be talking about this area and I want to be able to sit here. Okay, so if we were the, if we were modern and we dig up those square structures that we were just looking at his drawing, we would have to come up with an interpretation of what they are. Now, I've asked people when I just show them this, I have asked them for their opinions on what they are. You know more than they do because you have a book in your hand and you might have looked at it, but they didn't have any idea. I get all kinds of things. Storage rooms, one of my favorite, outhouses. <laughs> <laughs> you know, located outside uh, the site. But. That's what you're doing. If you don't have an ancient text to tell you what something is, then you're just kind of guessing. Okay, now look at this. I'll let more people come. Okay, now look at this. This is a big hole in the bedrock. It's green now, in the picture it's brown. But what, what, any ideas don't if you know then don't say but any <laughs> any ideas of what this might be 
A spring? Could be a spring, could be a well, a cistern, but we got this huge hole well. in the bedrock. And now let's come over here. We can find our way across the lake. <laughs> So here is another one. You see the paved floor? There's a paved floor right here and then this giant hole right here through the middle of it. Okay, maybe another cistern, storage area. Okay, now let's look at, let's look at these, uh, these are manger. You see this manger? So, can you imagine laying a baby in this manger, a newborn baby? And so if we have a manger right here, then uh, that's for animals to drink out of or eat out of. So if we come and not everybody has to climb up here, but if you do climb up here, you'll see that we have a spring here. You see the hoses coming out? They're still using the water today. It's a spring that in a later period was, uh, was, they put masonry around it and made it into a well. So if you look out at the site, one reason that this site is here is because we have water. Let's go look at one more thing. Okay, now I want you to come look at this. <laughs> what do you What do you think that is? It looks like a watering channel. Water channel, yeah. A water channel. Someone says. Back alley. Or a waste channel. Or a waste channel to take waste out. From an altar. Is it? Uh, do you think it's earlier than that wall? Contemporary with that wall, or later than that wall? Well, but it goes through the wall. Okay, then come look at this. And if you look at your plan, you can see that canal right there, whatever it is. And then look where I'm standing, right on the corner of some structure. We're just guessing. Who knows? By the way, look up here. We got a building. You can see it right here. And, and what's that at the end of it facing? Oh. Which way? Asp. It's an app. Apps. Yeah. Apps. Yeah. Um. And so and so, what might that building be? I don't know. Church. Could be a church. Uh, the church of the. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. The four churches. Okay. Now, look how easy this is. We turn the page to 10, and I'm just going to read one scripture right under time of Abraham, Genesis 13, 18, in that first column right there. And as I read this one scripture, all of a sudden the interpretation of this place is going to come alive. So Abram, of course later renamed Abraham, went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron where he pitched his tents 
There he built an altar to Yahweh. Okay, so right there in that one verse, then all of a sudden this place comes alive. You realize all this is here because this is where Abraham pitched his tent and built an altar to worship the Most High God. Okay, now if you look at the site, um, if you look at the next page 12, what I did is I took the different layers that, uh, that Mater had um, identified up in the left-hand corner, and then I color-coded them for you to make it as simple as possible. And then I put the layers from the latest down to the earliest. And what I want you to look at is the oldest layer is what I'm standing on, which is the purple. And if you look over at uh, the corner that I'm standing on, which would have continued over this way, do you see that all the rest of this site is centered around this? Including the church. Look at the church. One thing about this church, this is one of the four churches that Constantine commissioned to be built. But this is a short church. It's extremely short and wide. Why? Because this is in front of it. It was built in between two structures that already existed. One was an altar. And the other was that back wall back there, which is from the time of Herod the Great. Okay. So before we kick off the archeology, span let's just uh, go back over to page 11 and read the event that happened here, where, where Abraham built an altar. Um, this is on page 11, Genesis 18. Yahweh appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre. Why is this place here? Not just because Abraham camped here, but because Yahweh appeared to him Amen. here. Amen. That makes it not Amen. just a campsite, that makes it a holy place. Uh, the great trees of Mamre. What are these holes in, uh, in that we've saw, uh, seen here? Trees. Where are the great trees of Mamre once dead? Right? They grow right up through the bedrock, and uh, the only thing, the only thing that is evidence that they once stood here, is the holes that where once they stood. Makes sense, doesn't it? We got a spring of water right there, and big trees. What a nice place to have a campsite if you got a whole bunch of animals. Yeah. Yahweh appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three man, men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing, 90 years old. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then Yahweh said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for Yahweh? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I did not laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Then Yahweh said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? This is what he's about to do. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. Think of what an incredible promise this is to two old people, one of them barren, living in a tent. Uh, you hear in archaeology class, they say, there is no archaeological evidence for Abraham. 
The guy lived in a tent. <laughs> I, I grew up in Saudi Arabia around the Bedouin. I hung out with the Bedouin here for two and a half years making the film The Soul Shepherd. I could tell you from personal experience, it's hard to know where Bedouin were camped a week ago, much less 4,000 years ago. Okay, we should not expect to have direct archaeological evidence for people living in a tent 4,000 years ago. Let's be realistic. Um, but we do, actually. And, uh, and so let's start going through the archaeology. First of all, we have where the altar was. Mater put, put that what this is, is the foundations to Abraham's altar. And as we're going to read in later historical sources, what part of it is original? Is any part of this foundation original? We know that this altar was used and was here uh, century after century after century for thousands of years. At one point, it was used for paganism. At another point, it was commemorated by the church that was in front of it. So obviously, it was used for a very long time and repaired and rebuilt and who knows what part of it, you know, is what there's hardly anything left of it in the first place. But that is the most ancient part of the site for which the rest of the site is built around. Okay, then we have uh, next these two blue uh, squares out here. In fact, if you go over, we'll look at uh, pictures of them. Look on page 14, and there's a picture from Modder's excavation report that you can see them. See the man standing in them. So there's a A1 structure. And then where the man is standing is the A2 structure. And then there's a passage in between them. And uh, so Mater interpreted this is a gate. And certainly it is. We have lots of parallel gates from this time period. He dated it to the time of David, built at the time of David. That makes sense because what it is, is it's all that's left from an enclosure that was here during the Israelite kingdom period. See what I'm saying? Uh, it makes sense to me, Mater's interpretation, that David would be the one that built it because David reigned as king of Judah for seven and a half years, just a little over a mile that way. And so to commemorate the place of his forefathers would make a lot of sense. And so he dates it to uh, the time of David. Um, then the green layer that you see there on page 15 are these walls that, that enclosed even to the, today the site. You can see the gate in those walls that uh, we walked through over there. And then remember I was telling you about Lane Rittmeyer. This is his reconstruction uh, of Mamre. So you see in the middle of his reconstruction you see the, um, the altar that I'm standing on with with the walls around. Now this confused me for several years when I was thinking about this. I was thinking, okay, you have an altar, but, you know, and I was thinking the Jews wouldn't sacrifice on an altar because they got their altar in Jerusalem, right? That's their sacrificial altar. It, it, would, it would be sin to, to sacrifice on an altar outside of Jerusalem. Well, then it took me a long time to catch on, and I was like, oh, it's not a, an altar to use for sacrifice. It's Abraham's altar that is being commemorated here. Hmm. <clears throat> See what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, look at these magnificent walls in this site. Now, did Herod the Great do anything small? And if you're going to put these big, massive walls in, are you going to put them on soil or are you going to put them on bedrock? So when he did this, look over to... There was an enclosure here. It wasn't his idea to enclose this, this altar. But when he did it, when Herod the Great did his great enclosure, it wiped out the enclosure. Look again on the page 14. Wiped out the Israelite enclosure that was here before, except for the gate leading into it was all that survived. See? Just like in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount that Herod the Great expanded wiped out the, uh, the evidence for the, um, 
Temple Mount that was there before he did his expansion work. Okay. Um, and then we get to the church. One of Constantine's churches. And I'll read some of, uh, let's read some of the historical sources that we have on this. So in the first column, um, towards the bottom, that first quote, this is a Eusebius quote. He's quoting um, Constantine, a letter from Constantine. And Constantine is talking about Eutropia, his mother-in-law, who came and visited this site. So he says this, she, that is Eutropia, assures me then that the place which gains its name from the oak of Mamre, where we find that Abraham dwelt, is defiled by certain of the slaves of superstition in every possible way. She declares that idols, which should be utterly destroyed, have been erected on the side of that tree, that an altar is near the spot, and the impure sacrifices are continually performed. So guess what statue they found uh, here in the excavation? Hermes, the messenger of the gods. Now that makes sense, doesn't it? When you read the biblical story and you see these three, uh, two angels come with this figure. Uh, if you were Roman in your mindset or Greek in your mindset, you would see this as uh, Hermes. Um, the messenger of the God, that they're now using the, the altar that was originally built by Abraham to worship Yahweh is now being used um, to worship this God, Hermes. So here's what, what do you think Constantine's going to do about this? You think he's going to be, oh, that's okay, that's all right. No, you don't think he's, okay, let, look at the next one down. This is what uh, Constantine says, that every idol which shall be found in the place above mentioned shall immediately be consigned to the flames, that the altar be utterly demolished. The place itself we have directed to be adorned with an unpolluted structure, a church in order that it may become fitting place of assembly for holy men. So what had turned into idolatry then is destroyed, cleaned up, and then... Uh, they say that they demolished the one that the idols were uh, being worshipped on. They must have rebuilt it uh, in front of the church to be commemorated again as uh, Abraham's altar. So let's walk up there onto the church. Some of you can go up this wall, or maybe an easier way would be to come over right here where I am. Where's the apse? Right here. The apse is right up here. And then there's some steps. There's some steps over here. And you can come up onto this platform. Come on up if you want to, up onto here so you can see. Now, understand you're standing on the very, very foundation of the church. So the church would go way up from here. You can see a reconstruction by Mater on page 17 up at the top, um, how he reconstructed this church. And again, you can see that it's very wide, and you can see uh, that there is an altar in front of it. That's that's what the church is commemorating. So the apse is facing to the east. Okay, now, I wanna go back to page 11. At the bottom of the quote on the right column, the, the Genesis 18 quote. And I wanna say this. Uh, then Yahweh said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do He's about to do two things. Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. That's one thing. And 
Here's the other. All nations on earth will be blessed through him. Here's what I propose to you. The fulfillment of that promise can be seen in the archaeology itself on this site. Okay, let's take the first one. Abraham, you're living in a tent with your barren wife. You're going to have a son and you're going to become a great and powerful nation. That's the enclosure with the, with the, in blue with the gate out here when this was in uh, Israel, Kingdom of Israel enclosure. By the time they enclosed this, the Israelites, and commemorated the place that the promise was given that then led to their very existence yeah. as a kingdom and as a powerful nation. Mm -hmm. They came back to the spot that promise was given. Yeah, they, 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 didn't, uh, they didn't commit to the promise. The, the condition of the, the promise to be fulfilled for the Jews to, to have the right to be here was not fulfilled because God said that you need to, you need to go to that land but they didn't because they said we fear because it has uh, some mighty people in it. So, but they didn't pass the Sinai, the Sinai Desert. Not passing the Sinai Desert was uh, was the the, the flood, it's a fulfillment of the promise. Okay, thanks for sharing. Thanks for sharing. I'm sorry but, for sharing, but like I, I had to say. It. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. So that's one part, right? Sorry for interrupting anyway. It's okay. It's okay. So then the second part says that. Abraham, you and your barren wife, you will become, all nations on earth will be blessed through you. You will become a blessing to all nations on earth. See, that's what the church is doing here that's yeah. underneath our feet. Yeah. Uh, once this church was built on this spot to commemorate this place, then pilgrims, followers of Jesus came from all over the world to this place again to honor the promise that had been given here to abraham and sarah that now was fulfilled in their own salvation and their own coming here to worship uh, the god that they now worship which is the same god of abraham and sarah and of course it's what we're doing here right we come from the nations yeah. of the earth that God so faithfully made Abraham a blessing to. That's right. Now, go to page uh, 17. This is why the evidence that you see here is so important. Remember when we were at Megiddo um, and I was talking about Israel Finkelstein. Remember that? Israel Finkelstein is uh, one of the big critics of the Bible. So I have a quote from his, uh, the Bible unearthed down uh, here on the right column. It says this, it's, that meaning archeology, span finds have revolutionized the study of early Israel. He's an Israeli archeologist, by the way. Revolutionized the study of early Israel and have cast serious doubt on the historical basis of such famous biblical stories as the wanderings of the patriarchs. Some of the most famous events in the Bible clearly never happened at all. Okay, this is a quote in line with one that I've heard many times. There's no archeological evidence for Abraham. If there's no archeological evidence for Abraham, then what on earth are we standing on? To me, this is a monument yeah. of archeological evidence for Abraham. Think of the layers that rose over this place. When Mater got here, this was a mound. It was a mound of dirt over all of this. He dug through all those layers. What caused, if it wasn't Abraham, what caused that mound to rise? From the archeological evidence that goes back in the pottery from this site all the way back to Abraham. If you take that and you say that never happened, that's just a myth, then what, what is this place then? Is this a hoax? Somebody created a hoax somewhere and this whole place built up over a hoax? Is that be believable? Is that credible? Or is it more believable, more credible that what we're reading in our Bible is historical and actually happened yeah. and this site was commemorated because of that and the promise that was given here was fulfilled and therefore you have these layers of archaeology 
that go all the way up to the Islamic period. Look at, look at where Hebron, um, Hebron expanded, not over the top of this site, but around this site, right? Why? Because they know that this also is a sacred place. That's why they've built it up for people to hopefully come and visit. And, uh, and that's what it is. Um, go over past page 19 to page 20. Okay, now this is an aerial photograph of where we were yesterday. Here, keep your thumb there. Keep your thumb there and go to uh, page, page six, which is an aerial photograph of the site that we're standing on. See page six? Now flip over to page, the other page, the spread. You see the similarities? What? Do these two sites have in common if you flip back and forth? Both of them, the origin of both of these sites is God calling Abraham, making him promises, and Abraham built an altar at this site and at this site. And then from there, being commemorated or in some cases desecrated, the site built up archeologically over time. However, this one on the spread can't be dug because that would start World War III. But this site is an awesome parallel to understanding that site that's never been excavated because this site has been excavated all the way down to bedrock. So if you could, if we could excavate the other site, then we would expect to find something like what was found here with these excavations. Now, one more thing. Um, so if you go to page 10 and look at that map there, you see where we are, Jerusalem, Bethlehem, and then down to Mamre. So we're south of Jerusalem. Ezekiel 16, 46 says that Sodom is south of Jerusalem. And the very next thing in Genesis 18 that the Lord goes into with Abraham at this site is uh, the two angels that are with Jesus are going down to destroy Sodom. Now, why from here? Because we have an ancient route that goes from Hebron to the south, around the south side, we're on the south side of the Dead Sea, goes around the south side of the Dead Sea to Sodom. On the north side, we have a route also that goes from Jericho to Gilgal, across the Jordan River to, uh, to uh, Abel Shatim, to Beth Peor, and up to Hezbon. So we have these routes that come through here. This one goes to, to Sodom, which is why the next thing, that's when Abraham starts going, what if there was 50 righteous? What if there was 40 righteous? And then the Lord, if I find that many, then I'm not gonna destroy Sodom. And then the angels go from here down to um, Sodom. Now, if you go to, uh, we're almost done here, but if you go to the last page, then I wanna read a, a a Justin Martyr quote. Justin Martyr around 130 is when he said this, written down probably um, 10 to 20 years later. But let's read his quote there um, on the left column on page 18. Moses then, that blessed and faithful servant of God, tells us that he who appeared to Abraham under the oak tree of Mamre was God, sent with two accompanying angels okay so justin is saying it was god who appeared to abraham here of course that's what the text says that <laughs> yahweh appeared to uh abraham here with two angels um if we go over to the next uh, column then we see another quote from eusebius in ad 318 and he says and he that is jesus is no angel it wasn't three angels uh, but one greater than an angel, that God and, and Lord, who was seen beside the before-mentioned oak with the angels in human form. This would be our Lord and Savior, 
putting on a human form and shape and revealed to the godly ancestor Abraham who he was. Okay, now here, here's a question. We're reading early, early church theology there with Justin and Eusebius. In Constantine's reign, he only commissioned four churches to be built in the Holy Land. And out of those four, only one commemorates an Old Testament site. The other one we're going to go was where Jesus ascended. We have already been. We're going to go where Jesus was born, and we're going to go where Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead. All of those make sense. Why would he commemorate this place with a church when it's from the Old Testament? And we just read the reason why. Because of the belief of early Christians and still the belief of us, or at least me, <laughs> that, uh, that it was Jesus who appeared to Abraham here with two angels to Abraham and Sarah to promise the coming of himself as an offspring of Abraham through Sarah who would bless all the nations on earth. Wow. Wow. And yet, nobody comes here. It's tragic. Yeah. Um, it's just so awesome to thank you for the God and the way that you've been seeing and the way that you've been seeing and <laughs> absolutely, you should. Even the stones will cry out. Yeah, yes. absolutely. Yes. Okay, um, so as we make our way out, I want to show you. A... Notice, look at where I am. Don't trip while you're looking at me, though. <laughs> but uh, I want you to see this slanted rock right oh, here as you walk by. Yes. <laughs> And I want you to see this. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I am. I am. What was the, the little channel over there? Oh, the channel over there is for taking blood out from the altar. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. And it's, it's probably put in there from the pagan sacrifices that were going on there. Yeah. Good question, Eve. Yeah. Good question. So did everybody hear that? The question was, what is that channel over there? The channel comes from the altar and outside of the enclosure and it was t for taking blood, the blood of the sacrifices outside of the enclosure. They think that that um, was done by Hadrian. Good old Hadrian. Good old Hadrian went around and marked all of our sites for us so that we know where they are today. He was trying to destroy them and get rid of them, and he did the opposite. That's right. So I just... This, this stone is a, is, a, is a fragment of this same thing here. So I want you to look at this slanted back stone. This is what's called a parapet. And it goes up from here. And this whole wall, when it was preserved to it, whatever its full height would have been, would have had these parapets, <clears throat> these parapets in it. And so there are three places that um, Herod the Great built up to commit to, uh, to please his subjects, the Jews. And all three of those places, he built all kinds of things like palaces, but he didn't use this. He only used this style in holy places. Okay, so the three places he built up is Mamre, place we're going to next, Mechpela, and the place we were at yesterday, called by the Arab Haram El Sharif, and we call it uh, Temple Mount.
Mm -hmm. Right? So those yeah. three, Herod the Great built up to please the Jews. And so you can only see a few of these preserved here, but when we get to the next one of those three places, the next place we're going to is the best preserved of those, and you'll see these parapets there. Um, fully preserved. So that's why I wanted to do this.